Thank you, Jennifer. So I was one of the bad ones yesterday. <laughs> I ran away over. <laughs> so uh, if you look at your slide deck, you'll probably see that it's got some slides in it that I am not going to touch on today. Um, I have about an hour to talk about the universe of technologies, uh, which is an impossible task, since basically we could spend an hour on any one technology and maybe more than an hour a day. So uh, this is the agenda. Uh, we're going to talk about some of the remedial options, but uh, I'm not going to go through each of the technologies. It just wouldn't be um, able to do that in the time available and do it in justice. So I'm going to talk about some of the drivers uh, for the selection of these technologies uh, for it to be considered. And then uh, to make it more interesting, I throw in you know, some pictures, some examples just to talk about, talk through. Uh, the lesson learned section, everybody's going to do a lesson learned section. And the lesson learned section I'm going to talk about is really the state of the difference between the state of the practice in remediation and the state of the art in remediation. Um, one of the things that I've seen in the 37 years being here in the United States and doing this is basically that every technology has a state of the practice, which is very different from the state of the art. And it makes a big difference in the certainty of your outcome. Uh, understanding the state of the art and being able to use that approach and it, even for simple technologies that we'll talk about such as solid paper extraction. And uh, at the end I have a resource and there's a lot of resources if you want to look into these technologies in detail there's a lot of resources out there uh, you can find on the internet. Um, the uh, Environmental Protection Agency Cluen has a, a website that or is a website that basically has a lot of discussion of all the different technologies ITRC, the Navy, there's several different uh, websites you can go to to get uh, ad nausea information on any of these technologies. Uh, the starting point for my discussion is basically the uh, conceptual site model has already been developed for a site and basically um, the uh, what Nick had gone through basically the risk analysis has been completed and so you have specific standards that you're trying to achieve in water or soil or whatever the media is, and that's the starting point for this discussion. As I mentioned, basically there is a lot of different technologies out there that are available to you. This is a sampling of those. So you can see that there's no way in hell we can cover that in an hour. So basically we're going to talk about some of the drivers for um, choosing a particular technology. There is no magical pixie dust. Uh, basically, no matter what you read and what you see people talking about, these are driven by science. Um, that's where you're going to have success is by considering science and engineering. And basically, um, there is no magical uh, you know, answer. Um, what you're going to see in the discussions later on today is a lot more detail and some specifics. Some of the things that are extremely important that we're going to talk about a little and others are going to talk about in more detail is understanding your geology and your hydrogeology and very important to cost effective remediation and effective remediation successful remediation is going to be detailed characterization of where the contaminant is you really need to understand that to have the best chance of getting success and that that's important we're not going to cover it here but it will be covered by others later on today So what typically drives, uh, I'm a remediation consultant contractor, I've been doing this for a long time, and basically sometimes we come into a project and it's already been decided, we're going to do soil river extraction, we're going to do ISCO, we're going to do chemical reduction, we're going to do in situ stabilization, and sometimes you're dictated as to what you need to do and you really need to, uh, the, the focus where we would do is on the design aspect and implementation aspect. But many times we're basically, when I'm looking at a site data and deciding what technology might be most applicable, uh, obviously there's a number of factors that you have to consider. Cost is always a major factor. And again, it'll be discussed in more detail later. But two of the things that I really look at is the geology. Um, the detailed geology, the detailed characterization of the contaminant and the contaminants themselves are major factors that I would consider um, in this process. The other ones are important too, time frame, obviously the meter goal and cost. And as a remediation contractor, basically, it, 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 that rule of thumb is pretty much true, is it takes about, you know, 50% of the cost to get about 90% of the way there. And then basically the rest uh, of the cost to get that last 10%. So let's uh, talk about geology in a little more detail. Um, 
with respect to these different remediation technologies. And it, it's a lot of this. A lot of this stuff over the years is, is sort of common sense. Uh, obviously, if you're dealing with the geology that's more permeable sandy material, and you're looking at in situ technologies, which is not the only options too. You obviously have uh, ex situ technologies as well. But if you're looking at a sandy environment, which has got reasonable permeability, um, the and Paul will talk about this later on this afternoon in the last talk. But basically, remediation really to be effective requires contact. You have whatever reagent you're choosing, whether it's a biological reagent, whether it's a chemical reagent, whatever the reagent you're using to tie up or destroy your contaminants of concern, basically, if you cannot contact them effectively in the right dosage amounts with your contaminants, you're not going to be successful. You're going to get rebound, or you're not going to have a successful project. When you're dealing with high permeability sandy materials, which unfortunately doesn't make up a lot of the sites across the country, um, it's easier. You have more options. It's easier to get that contact. It's easier to deliver reagents at sufficient volumes to where the contaminant is to be successful. And so sandy sites allow you to have a higher chance of success, but also a higher number of potential options that are available to you um, to get those reagents in. As you start to get into more complex soils, like lower permeability soils like silts, again, the it's very important to get the right dosage of whatever you're put, need to put into the environment to destroy the contaminants concern. When you get into silts and clay materials, basically, it's much more difficult to deliver the quantities that you want to deliver to be able to destroy the contaminant of concern, and therefore that drives the time and the cost associated with that. Uh, bulk clays, basically, um, before we get into heterogeneous, extremely low permeability. The reality is with bulk clays is that you're not going to be able to inject using wells into a bulk clay and deliver enough reagents to destroy the contaminant that's in there. It's just, it just doesn't happen. So you're going to have to do something more aggressive to introduce into a bulk clay the reagents necessary for that. But backing off into what Nick talked about this morning, basically, the first, the key for me is, is the risk really driven by what's in the clay? Is what's in the clay basically going to diffuse out of that clay at a rate that is acceptable and below criteria? And therefore, I don't have to deal with it. So that's a very important aspect of that detailed characterization. Where is the contaminant? And more importantly, where is the risk associated with that contaminant? If, it's, if there's contamination in the clay, and if you take, for example, a chlorinated solvent site that's been there for decades, there is penetration into low permeability materials of those contaminants. But is there a risk associated with that that needs to be addressed? That's a very important question because it's going to be much more difficult to address that. But it can be done. But injection approaches for clays is limited by the volumes you can introduce and limited by the ability to contact that without, again, getting more aggressive, like using fracturing techniques or introducing a barrier through a fracture, a barrier or a permanent reactive barrier system through a fracture into that environment to prevent it from bleeding out into your your water, more permeable zones. So it restricts uses of some of the technologies. You know, our most common sites or most common geologies are heterogeneous. Uh, but basically, they're combinations of sands, silts, clays, all the different uh, geological structures that are out there. Again, very important to understand, and again, we'll be talking more detail in some of the examples this afternoon, of doing that proper rapid assessment of uh, characterization tools, as many tools available as to us today that weren't available back in the 70s and 80s that are now available that help you characterize. You don't want to be cleaning at 50,000 cubic yards when 5,000 cubic yards is what's really the uh, cause of your risk, and you want to understand that. So where the contaminants are within that heterogeneous environment and where that risk is is basically critical to the success of your remediation approach. Bedrock uh, obviously has its own concerns with regard to understanding where the contaminant is and being able to get to it, uh, but there can be success obviously on bedrock depending on how well you understand that contaminant uh, distribution. I just want to show you a couple of examples, like I said, to make it more interesting, throw in a few slides of sites that we've worked on. Uh, this particular one is looking at a application of potassium permanganate uh, an oxidant, which is very effective at destroying a lot of the chlorinated ethenes, as an example. Um, not very effective chlorinated ethanes, but at the chlorinated ethenes. 
And what you're looking at here is some cores from a remediation site post-application or post-injection of the permanganate. And what you're seeing is I actually do have a pointer. And what you're seeing, obviously, on this particular core, you're seeing the pink-purple associated with permanganate. Um, that's one of the nice things about permanganate chemistry is basically you can visually see it in your cores and in your wells. So this shows you that in this injection scenario that the sandier material or silty sandy material that was above this clay, there was good distribution of your reagent, in this particular case permanganate, to destroy the chlorinated solvent contaminants. And that was very effective doing it. This is the bulk clay. Uh, below that more permeable layer. And you can see there's very little coloration associated with that. Uh, one of the ladies that works in our office, basically she done her doctorate on uh, basically the penetration of reagents into low permeability, very low permeability materials. And you can get penetration, but don't forget these contaminants have been there for decades. They've been able to penetrate in significant distances. When you put in your, your reagent, it can penetrate in a foot or two, basically over a reasonable time frame but it's not going to penetrate much further than that. Um, so again, depends where that risk is. If your risk is associated with your sandy materials and your upper inch or so of clay, there's a good chance you can treat it. But if it's, if it's in, penetrated into that clay, you're going to have to be more aggressive with inducing the, uh, the uh, reagent. So in this particular case, the uh, clay was not a big a concern with regard to risk, and this was able to treat it. Um, through the, the process. But again, showing you the role of geology in your selection of technology, and not only selection of technology, but selection, and Paul will go into this in more detail this afternoon, in the method of delivery of those oxidants or those reagents. So here is a different site, again, with bulk clay, but this is a site where the client basically wanted to get out of the site. He wanted to have no restrictions on this particular site. We wanted to be uninhibited. And so basically, there was chlorinated solvents in a bulk clay. There wasn't permeable zones. It was a bulk clay. It had penetrated into this clay over decades. The plume wasn't moving very far, as you would expect, in this bulk clay environment. So what you're seeing here, basically, is you could, again, if the client wasn't looking to get out of this site unrestricted, obviously, you can, some of the things that Nick talked about, about capping institutional controls, containment systems are appropriate. Excavation is appropriate, but then it's uh, typically expensive too. Uh, but it, it is something you need to consider when you're doing your cost benefit of the different options. In this particular case, this was inside a building. You can see it's actually inside a building. And basically, it's clay in the base of the building. And um, there was no way to inject this permanganate and get a high certainty of distributing it throughout the bulk clay to be able to achieve that goal of, of uh, unrestricted use. So basically, we had to go in with a more aggressive method to introduce the oxidant. In this particular case, this is actually a, a rock grinder tool that fits on an excavator bucket, uh, an excavator. And basically, this tool is able to introduce the reagents into this bulk clay very effectively. And it was able to be used down to about 20 feet into this bulk clay and introduce that reagent to destroy the contaminant concern. So you do have to get more aggressive if you're going to have to have that. There is risk, and you have to get your uh, remedial goal in this particular case on restricted use. Again, stratified is interesting. Um, as we said, that's a more common one. You do have the high permeability lenses that are typically where your contaminant, if you just think through where your contaminant's going to move, it's basically going to move through the more permeable layers. It's going to diffuse into the less permeable layers. And again, depending on the scale of that, if you've got a sandy environment with small salt lenses that are an inch or two thick, you've got a good chance of treating those too, because again, your reagent, if it's not if it's not very short lived, can penetrate with, uh, can penetrate into that material. Or if you set up a biological system, you're going to set up a long term system that allows bleed from those small layers into that environment to be destroyed. These are all factors that you have to consider. Um, when you get a heterogeneous environment, and I give the example yesterday, basically, of one of the uh, first pure oxygen biosparging projects that we worked on, 
and we worked on it by default. There was a, in Massachusetts here, there was a very significant Cadillac type of air sparging curtain system that was designed for a plume of arsenic and benzene moving towards a property boundary. Um, on the other downgrading inside of the property, digital existed at the time and digital had a pond. And the system was turned on, the air sparging system was turned on and uh, everybody was looking down at the, you know, what's happening right in the area of the air sparging. And lo and behold, behind them in the pond basically became a jacuzzi. Um, because the air, because the geology was stratified and what happened is air and any reagent you add is gonna find the path of least resistance. And the path of least resistance was not up, it was horizontal. And so the air moved horizontally into the pond and basically the fish were happy, it was very aerated. And basically, but the client or the uh, digital wasn't happy because the contamination was also moving into that. Uh, so basically, but the the issue there was they, so the client who had, had uh, purchased and, and uh, installed this very expensive air sparging system wanted to know what could be done. Well, in that geology, you're not gonna change the geology cost effectively in that particular case because of the length and size of it. So basically the solution there was to say, well, arsenic can be immobilized um, using oxygen, uh, creating, you know, uh, we'll talk about metals a little later, but it can create iron oxyhydroxides which can absorb arsenic. Um, arsenic can be converted from arsenic three to arsenic five, which becomes more immobile. And benzene can also be aerobically degraded. So in this particular case, basically by changing the air sparging to a pure oxygen sparging system, you didn't have to worry as much about the structure of the soil, and you were able to introduce the oxygen at different levels within the soil structure and be an effective technology without causing the jacuzzi to really. So again, this is how geology and uh, factors into, and your contaminant itself factors into what is the technology that you can use if it's not dictated to you. We don't want to dial up yet. So let's shift from the geology, and I know that we've, we've just gripped the surface, but let's talk about the contaminants and their role. And we're gonna talk about a, a few of the contaminants as we move through, and I've picked, I've added a few, which I'm not sure they're in the slide deck. I, I added one for the axion and PFAS. Obviously emerging contaminants, even though they've been around for decades, they're emerging with respect to what's going on regulatory-wise with them. So we'll talk about those in a few minutes, but let's start off with talking about volatiles. So with volatile uh, contaminants, again, we have a larger suite of options available to us. You know, volatiles are typically more soluble type of components, which makes them, if you look at technologies such as biological technologies or chemical technologies, they depend on the dissolution of the contaminant into the aqueous phase because that's where the reaction occurs. It occurs in the aqueous phase. So you need to get them into that phase to be able to be effective. That's why when you're looking at something like a D-napple or a napple of significant volume, biological processes have a role, but it's typically not to be the primary technology because the time frame for contaminants to dissolve into the water to be bioremediated with the typical half lives that biological processes work in the aqueous phase can easily go up into years and years of time necessary just for the mass transfer of the contaminants into the water fields. So basically, it's a, uh, the uh, volatiles, they are uh, subject to different chemical technologies, biological technologies, and physical technologies as is described in the, uh, the system. And, and again, in some of the examples you see this afternoon, you'll see the combinations of technologies. Um, because of that sort of 50-90 you know, rule, a lot of times you're going after the source with a more aggressive technology, and you're going after that residual plume with like an MA or a PRV or something that typically is a more cost-effective approach. But uh, so volatiles have got a large suite of uh, options available to you. Napple, as I mentioned a few a second ago, uh, basically the issue with the napple or the denapple is if you go after them with like a chemical process, for example, it's very typical. If, for example, if you take a petroleum and you're taking something like an oxygen like uh, or sulfate. Um, the typical ratio you require per pound is about a 10 or 20 to one. So if you've got a, you know, a pound of contamination that's in apple form, 
it can take not only do you have the dissolution issue you have to deal with, but it can take a large amount of chemical addition to destroy that pound of, that pound of chemical or pound of contaminant. And therefore, it's usually cheaper to remove as much of that napal or L napal or D napal you can before you polish with a, an alternative technology. So uh, the napal removal uh, can vary from you know, sort of passive methods of skimming where you don't have a lot of it in there and you're taking it out of the system in a slow but cheap way versus more aggressive systems like surfactant enhanced product recovery, which is a, uh, a process you can either use it under vacuum to enhance the removal or the movement of the fluids in the subsurface, or you can do it just without the vacuum. But the surfactant enhanced product recovery, it's getting uh, fairly popular for some of the petroleum sites where you're not required like at refineries and the like of that, where you're not required to get down to very low groundwater standards because of the, the nature of the contamination in the area. Um, but it's, it's a technology that's uh, fairly quick and, and fairly popular in that use. And as I mentioned, you can preclude some technologies where time frame is important because if you have NAPL or DNAPL and you're not attacking that in a separate manner, the, uh, that can take a long time and be very costly because of the uh, the reagent cost or just the limitation of the time frame. Semi-volatiles, we'll talk about them for a second. Again, less volatile, less susceptible to solid vapor extraction or sparging technologies, but more very susceptible chemical oxidation reduction, thermal uh, in situ uh, solidification, and again, bioremediation, as long as basically you don't have a large mass or a limited time frame. This is a, a site we done. It was a demonstration project for a coal and tar site for the Electrical Power Research Institute back a number of years ago. And it was one of the first uh, demonstrations of sulfate technology. Um, it was actually developed by uh, the University of Connecticut and uh, United Technologies. And, and it was, uh, we got the opportunity to uh, apply the technology right from the development stage into a few different sites. And this was one of them. This was an every demonstration. And what you're looking at here at the, the top core is the pre-treatment. And you can see what you would ex typically expect for like a coal tar, that dark petroleum-like staining of, and this was a sandy material, salty sandy material. And you can see the coal tar basically throughout that upper uh, photograph. After one application of persulfate, again, injections, materials, the permeability is such that we can deliver the reagent with a high certainty to where the contaminant mass was. And you can see here, basically, you can start to see the sandy structure and color associated with that. It's not you know, uh, uh, totally clean at this stage of one application, but basically you can see the dramatic change in what happened as a result of, again, understanding the geology and understanding the dosing of the contaminant necessary or the reagent necessary. Uh, this is a quick example that I threw in because it's an interesting one. Um, this one was semi-volatiles and volatiles. Uh, this one was driven by a very aggressive remediation schedule of 18 months. When you look at the mass of the VOCs and the semi-volatiles, some typical technologies like solid vapor extraction, bioremediation, we're not going to meet. They were going to be effective for treating this type of soils or this type of contamination. But the issue was basically timing. How do you accomplish that within 18 months? The client selected a thermal approach, an in-situ thermal approach to go after this until he seen the price tag. And then basically he said, okay, what different options do you have? So actually it was a thermal vendor that su suggested to the client that he come to us and basically do a treatability study. We have a treatability lab. And do a treatability study and look at what do I need to do? I, I can't, I know that ambient temperature uh, SVE, ambient temperature, ambient temperature, biological processes are not going to meet this, this remedial time frame. Um, oxidation processes are going to be expensive because of the, this is a two or three acre area. And we'll, we'll talk about that in a little more detail later, but um, whoops, I here before I should. So basically, uh, the treatability study basically looked, okay, well, um, the cost of the thermal is really boiling the water. It's really that energy required to boil the water over that end. What if we could basically, let's look at what we can ha expect to happen if we raise the temperature uh, to a, a lower temperature than 100 and basically look at the changes or the removal rates 
consolidate their extraction enhanced by the thermal process because as you know you basically get a significant increase in vapor pressure for increases in temperature it's an exponential type relationship and biologically the rule of thumb is about a 10 degree raise is about a doubling of the biological degradation so you would expect both to have improvements at different temperatures up to a limit up to a limit obviously for the biological before they don't like uh, being in that hot of water um, so the treatability study looked at that to just basically see if there was an option that would be available. And uh, from the, there was an interesting thing, a couple of interesting things that came out of the treatability study. The first thing that came out is the, the soils that they provided were very tight, uh, which is going to make soil vapor extraction more difficult to get the amount of air through the system that you might need. But also it brought them back and we, we asked them, well, where is your contamination? Where is your risk? And basically, they went back and they've done some detailed characterization, which again will be discussed in some of the case studies this afternoon. And they found that the vast majority of the mass was tied up in the very silty materials, which was going to restrict the airflow capabilities. But anyway, the, it ended up that the treatability study also showed that the, uh, about 80% of the removal in the treatability was through the biological processes. So what came out of that treatability study, which again, Paul talked about treatability studies this afternoon and their role in remedial design, and I'll talk a little about them later on. Basically, what we find from that is, again, a biological process of about 40 degrees centigrade was the primary mechanism that was going to reach this uh, aggressive schedule in the most cost-effective manner. And that's what basically happened. You can see it after eight months of operation, these were based on soil samples throughout the two to three acres, combined with the oxygen utilization data from the off gases. You can measure with the depletion of oxygen and equate that to you know, some destruction of the contaminants, as well as non-contaminants. But about 60% reduction in total mass in about uh, eight months, 12 months of operation, there was all but two little hot spots left that were uh, didn't meet closure. And after 18 months, the full system was closed and approved for closure by the agency, which was New York. So this is sort of like a little summary diagram. Paul's got a similar one he's going to show this this afternoon, but this is just a little one that we came up with looking at organic contamination and where's the sweet spot. And this, some of the references that I give at the, at the very end have similar sort of tables or figures where they highlight where's the sweet spot for these different contaminations based on costs, et cetera, associated with those. Again, from my perspective, that's fine, but look at the geology, look at the detailed characterization of where the contaminants are, and look at the logistics of getting your reagents to them. Those are the key, key variables that I would look for as a remedial engineer. Let's talk about some of the other contaminants, basically metals. So uh, metals are unique with respect to current comparison to the organic contaminants. The organic contaminants can be easily destroyed. You're going to break apart the carbon, the hydrogen, whatever else is in that element or that compound, and they can be broken apart into elemental compounds fairly readily. Metals cannot be destroyed. That's an element. You're not going to destroy the metals. So you're either going to basically isolate them so that they don't impact the water, or you're going to remove them by excavation if you have a soils criteria that you have to meet or cover them, as, as uh, Nick said, with the, with the appropriate depth of materials. But if you're looking at an in situ approach, then chemical stabilization is really what you've got going for you. Um, again, other than the capping or isolation. So chemical stabilization, since you're not destroying the metals, what you're looking to do is one of three things. You've got basically the fact that if you can uh, cause that metal to combine and precipitate with another element, that the resulting compound solubility is extremely low, below the criteria of concern from a risk perspective, that's a very effective way of taking a metal and the risk associated, which, which is typically in the dissolved phase, into uh, being able to be effective at removing it. Not all compounds, metals are all very different. Some react opposite ends of the scale. You know, arsenic, if you take arsenic-3, which is a reduced form, you oxidize it, you, you form arsenic-5, which is much, more, much less toxic, much more readily uh, taken care of. Chromium is the opposite. You know, chromium-6, which is the oxidized form of chromium, is a, is a toxic one and the more mobile one. You know, chromium, the reduced chromium basically is the one that basically you can take care of more readily. So they, they have very variable in what these metals are. One of the areas of uh, that's becoming, we're doing a lot of treatability work on at the moment is ash pond leachates you know, from these coal tar sites. 
This, this is a bigger exhibit at some interesting metals for um, molybdenum as well as arsenic and some of the other typical ones with some interesting metals that are, that are very different in, in how to deal with them. But so you've got precipitation, but sometimes that precipitant is the solubility of that precipitant is above your criteria and therefore that's inadequate. The other mechanism is co-precipitation. What happens with a lot of metals is when something is forming, like for example, if you were to oxidize an environment like the one we were talking about with that, uh, that the uh, our sparging system converted to a, a biosparging system, if you convert the dissolved iron into iron oxyhydroxide, which is a very stable compound at neutral pHs, basically it will encapsulate arsenic into the structure of the crystal and make it unavailable for the water. So co-precipitation is the other mechanism. And the third mechanism is basically absorption on some of these compounds that are formed. So the iron oxyhydroxides also have a lot of active absorption sites that again can act as a sponge to remove uh, some of the heavy metals like arsenic from the uh, waters. So these are the mechanisms that you have to actually drop the concentrations in the water to acceptable levels. They're typically driven by the pH and the ORP or the oxidation reduction potential or EH of the groundwaters. Uh, these are reversible reactions. So if you've got like you form an iron oxyhydroxide and then basically you have an acid spill or you've got an upgrading groundwater or the pH is at five or something like that, it can redissolve these and re-release the contaminants. You have to be aware of that. You have to be aware of that. So some of the, the compounds that, that do form um, sulfur for a lot of metals, Sulfide, metal sulfides are a very low perme or low, low solubility compound that you can form. That's why like a calcium polysulfide is a popular additive or reagent to tie up some of the heavy metals because the metal sulfides that are formed, not for all metals, but for some of them or for a good number of them, the solubility is, is pretty low. Here's an example showing you, this is a diagram showing you the solubility of the metal compound or the metal sulfide that's formed as a function of different pHs. So let's look at uh, two examples. So let's look at lead. Lead is PB1. Uh, well, and the lead, or the MCL for lead in this particular state at this particular time was, or this particular one was 15 parts per billion. And this line represents lead. And you can see at low pHs, the solubility of lead sulfide is above that uh, dotted brown line, which is the MCL. So if you have a site where it's got low pH, you would have to adjust the pH of that site to more neutral to form uh, iron sulfide, or sorry, lead sulfide that was uh, relatively insoluble relative to the MCL. But in the typical range of waters, in the neutral sort of range, where a lot of groundwaters fit, the lead sulfide is well below the MCL. So you would have a successful reduction of, iron, of uh, lead in that compound. I mentioned arsenic, so here's arsenic up here. And you can see that the MCL for arsenic is way down here and it's, it's getting lowered, but we're using 10 ppb here in this particular example. Um, it's 10 b going downwards. Uh, you can see it's well above. So forming arsenic sulfide would not solve your issue because the arsenic sulfide solubility would still be above that criteria. So you'd be looking in that particular case to take care of arsenic through either co-precipitation or absorption on some of these minerals that are formed. I've got a couple of slides on 140-oxy, and how am I doing for time? Good? Wow. <laughs> I can slow down, yeah. <laughs> so we'll talk about 140-oxy. 140-oxy, uh, we just talked about none of these contaminants are really emerging in the sense that they've been around for decades. And 140-oxy has become more prevalent because, you know, uh, of toxicological information that basically suggests, hey, we should be concerned about 140-oxy. And one of the primary uses of 1,4-dioxium is obviously as a stabilizer in chlorinated solvents. And therefore, a lot of chlorinated solvent sites where you weren't looking for 1,4-dioxium, you're basically saying, hey, you have 1,4-dioxium at that particular site because you know chlorinated solvents were used, in particular the chlorinated ethanes, which you can see it with chlorinated ethanes too. Um, so basically, it's, re it's a, one of the many reopeners for sites, 1,4-dioxium. And uh, so what, what options do we have for 1,4-dioxium from a remedial perspective? So I have a couple of slides. So 140 action, um, one of the sites that we were asked to work on with 140 action was a, a, about a 25 year pump and treat system at a landfill in New Jersey. And basically, so the landfill had a uh, you know, pump and treat system and the treat part of the system was a filtration system followed by activated carbon. 
Well, 1,4-dioxane is not very well absorbed on unactivated carbon. So when they'd done and had tested the landfill for 1,4-dioxane, they found it all over the place in the landfill. If it was a hot spot, you could go after it from a remediation perspective and taking care of that hot spot. But this was diffuse throughout this landfill. And landfills, typically acres, multiple acres. So it wasn't going to be cost effective. They already had a pump and treat system in place. So the question was, okay, when we sample our effluent, it's devoid of the chlorinated solvents, but not 1,4-dioxane. It passed right through the filter, right through the carbon system. And therefore, you have to look at sort of modules that you can do, uh, add to this. So some of the technologies that do work is, um, so this is the first top right slide is absorption on resins. <clears throat> now, these resins are engineered plastics. And they typically have the capability for ion exchange as well as absorption. And they're engineered to be more, have higher capacity for a lot of these contaminants. They're more costly per pound than carbon, but in this particular case, carbon wasn't an option. Um, so the resins, and you can see the influent concentration around about 100 parts per billion, and the uh, achieved was uh, less than a single part per billion, was less than 0.4 uh, parts per billion. Another mechanism that treats 1,4 dioxin is oxidation technologies. Oxidation technologies can destroy their, the 1,4 dioxin structure is such that it's it's a bit very soluble, very low uh, Henry's coefficient, uh, which is a measure of the concentration of the vapor phase overlying the aqueous phase, and basically, but they are susceptible to being pulled apart, being destroyed, and oxidation chemistry certainly per sulfate and other chemistries can destroy. This is an example site. Are you awake, Nate? Where are you? <laughs> He's awake. Okay, so Nate knows this site. Um, he got us involved in a long time ago, but basically 1,4-dioxane as well as chlorinated solvents can be destroyed by per sulfate. <clears throat> a couple other mechanisms. This, this one actually basically is the Department of Defense funded a CERTIP project. CERTIP is sort of like a little uh, research arm of the Department of Defense looking at con concepts, remedial concepts. If you ever want to see what's coming down the pike in remediation technologies, go onto the CERTIP website, which is a Department of Defense website, and they fund a lot of fundamental research on different technologies that they might be interested in dealing with different contaminants. Right now, they're spending a lot of money on PFAS, which we're going to talk about in a minute or two, um, and different technologies looking at destruction of PFAS. So, they did do one where they basically done a field demonstration on their ESTCP is where they take the theory of a, of a uh, technology and then they try it in the field. So CERTIP is a fundamental research on the technology. ESTCP is basically the fundamental field demonstration of that technology. So this was the ESTCP and they were looking to see if they did thermally enhanced SVE on the veto zone for a 1,4 dioxane issue, could they remove it? And they could. Because what happens is, as I mentioned, for the biological or the other case study that I mentioned, basically the temperature rises, the volatility rises, the Henry's coefficient rises, and it's more readily uh, removable. And that's what happened in this particular site. The vapor concentration way down here, because of the low Henry's coefficient, low volatility, increased um, as a result of the thermal enhancement, then decayed as you would expect with any sort of solid vapor extraction system. But it was effective at removing the 1,4 dioxane from the subsurface. The biological processes, people love biological processes. They can be more uh, robust, longer time living, cheaper. And it's, it's a popular, it's a go-to technology that most people will look at unless there's conditions such as, as I mentioned, DNAP or something that would drive the time and cost being not uh, practical for a site-specific application. So when you look at the research that's available on 1,4 dioxin and biological processes, that you can see that people have discovered uh, bacteria that will use 1,4-dioxane as a primary food source. Unfortunately, these uh, particular bacteria are difficult to grow and they're, they're sort of like finicky. And so basically, they're not, it's not the most popular way to go after it from a biological perspective. But a more robust biological process is aerobic uh, processes which are in the presence of oxygen. But it's a co-metabolic process. In other words, you're eating your dinner. You've got a, whatever your preference is for dinner, and you've got a side salad. The side salad you take, it's not necessarily what you went there for, but you, you get it. That's sort of the co-metabolic process. The side salad is the destruction of the 1,4-dioxane. And uh, so the co-metabolic process is 
bacteria that can use a different food source. Uh, propane was one of the more popular ones, propanotrophs are the name of the bacteria. And they're sort of ubiquitous in the environment, but they're slow to grow. So if you don't have them in good enough numbers, you may have to populate with them. And this is a treatability study that was performed not by us, but by some colleagues from a pharma company that I work with, uh, basically looking at the, uh, the changes in the concentration one for the axion as a function of different additives. A little hard to read, but they're losing oxygen, they're using oxygen and propane, they're using oxygen and propane and nutrients. And none of those for that particular site was working very effectively until they added bacteria. And the reason that it wasn't effective was because the numbers of the propanotropes were low and it take a while to grow. So basically in this particular case for this study, they added some, and when they added some, this is this purple line, you can see that it dramatically dropped down the concentration one for the oxygen right away. The increase again, the spike was they actually spiked the reactor again with one for the oxygen. And again, it dropped like a stone. And again, they done it a third time. So it being a very effective process um, and more robust than the direct use of oxygen or uh, one for the oxygen by bacteria. Uh, shifting to uh, the peripheral ones. Uh, again, I teach a four hour workshop on this. So we're gonna cover it in two slides. Um, <laughs> Basically, I only talk about it because obviously it's in, you know, you go to any conference and any uh, ones that are basically dealing with PFAS, they're full. It's standing room only. It's just, you know, everybody wants to know about PFAS. Um, I was talking to Doug uh, a few minutes ago and one of the issues is basically I see with PFAS is at the levels that they're going down to from a regulatory perspective, which is going down to now 10 parts per trillion in some states, there's no way, there's, no, there's not the money in the world to deal with the issues that we have with, with PFAS at 10 parts per trillion. So something's gonna to have to break, something's gonna to have to change. Risk is probably gonna be a big factor in, in this and how to deal with it. There's just not enough money um, uh, to deal with it. But anyway, that's besides the fact. <laughs> um, so let's talk a little about those. I have a couple of slides just to talk about them. So what you hear about is perfluorinated and polyfluorinated alkyl substances, PFAS. The difference is that this is the PFOA, which is one of the ones that we do have a lot of information for. One of the sort of other big conceptual issues is there's several thousand PFAS compounds, and basically we only are able to analyze for about two dozen. And the primary reason for that is there's no analytical standards for the rest at this time, and it'll probably be years before we do. Um, the other bigger problem is there is very limited toxicology information except for a handful. So basically, we just don't know if there's others there that are our big concern or not. We just don't have that information. So again, from a remedial perspective, I can deal with what you're focusing on, like PFO and PFOS, which are the two primary ones. They're both uh, carbon uh, PFAS materials. But there's a, a, lo a large range of PFAS from 2 carbon up to 18 carbon. So there's a large range of these. But the focus is because we have more information about PFO and PFOS. And they were some of the primary ones manufactured that basically, uh, and there's in information suggesting toxicity. Although I did review for uh, one of the journals last year, a paper on the toxicology associated with PFOA and PFOS. And I came away after reading that article saying there's as many studies that said there's no issue as there was studies saying there is issue. Obviously we take a conservative approach and assume that, that there is an issue, but there's a lot of, a lot of unknowns. That's a, that's a big takeaway from PFOS. But anyway, the, the structural difference, which is very important, is the, the perfluorinated ones, basically, this is the backbone, what's termed the backbone of the molecule. And the backbone, every carbon is uh, connected to a fluoride. So it's fully saturated with carbon and fluorides. Now, the carbon fluoride bond is a extremely strong bond. Very difficult to break, requires high energy to break. Polyfluorinated's basically mean that somewhere, on this, this particular one that before has the acid, which basically is a uh, anionic charge. It's a charged head. It's got a charge associated with it, and the, the body's uncharged, which gives it the ability for ion exchange, and it gives it the ability for absorption, which are two of the most popular uh, uh, processes in, in work today. The, poly, uh, the polyfluorinated ones, somewhere in the structure of the backbone, a fluoride is missing, or more than one fluoride is missing, and it's replaced by a hydrogen or sulfate or something. Something else, that's why it's called a polyfluorinated one. That creates a weak spot. 
and that weeks back. So if you hear people or you read something about transformation of PFAS, you're typically reading something that's saying somebody's seen a polyfluorinated one convert, be be that bond be broken where the weak spot is. But typically, there's a lot of free fluoride in the in the environment. Typically, it forms a perfluorinated, so it goes from you know not necessarily good to bad. A frying pan, you know, the cut the frying pan. So basically, um, that's the that's one of the issues that you you've got to deal with the, with the perfluorinated compounds. Uh, and these bonds are extremely strong. And what does that mean? It means that a lot of your typical technologies are not going to work very effectively for PFAS to destroy them uh, from a destruction perspective because it requires high energy. Um, we get our first involvement with PFAS was about 15 years ago when we were approached by one of the primary manufacturers of PFAS and sort of said, hey, you know, is there any technologies, can you do your screening level treatability, any of the technologies that would be effective? at uh, actually destroying those. And at that time, basically, we tested a number of different technologies. And the one that basically showed some promise was oxidative technologies, but complex oxidative technologies that had, that formed oxidation species, reductive species, and I got to move on. <laughs> so, um, so the bottom line is basically the non, what's most popular is the non-destructive technologies. And that's because basically not require the high energy. They have properties that allow them to be filtered out with the nano filtration at about 90% effective reverse osmosis is about 90% effective. So if you're looking at 10 parts per trillion and you've got more than 100 parts per trillion in your influent water, you're going to need to do some sort of combined polishing step because your reverse osmosis, your nano filtration is not going to do it by itself. Um, Activated carbon, very effective. Resin is very effective. Again, cost benefit on a site specific basis. The issue is basically that again, there, and I don't have time to show it here, but basically not all the PFAS are going to be absorbed on carbon or they're going to break through much quicker. That's okay. <laughs> the, uh, so they're going to break through much quicker. So even if you use carbon, you got to be aware that there may be other PFAS that's breaking through the carbon or breaking through the resins. And basically, but they're not being quantified, or we don't know about the toxicity of them. But those are the two go-to technologies. So if you look at anything that's being done a pump and treat system, or to capture that, uh, basically these are the non-destructive technologies. That leaves you with the concentrated waste stream you have to deal with, and typically they're dealt with by incineration at like a thousand degrees centigrade or more. But a lot of the DoD funding research is looking at alternative mechanisms to basically look at destruction of the PFAS um, that are of lower cost than incineration of thousand degrees centigrade. Electrochemical processes, plasma, synalysis, phytolysis, there's a lot of different techniques that they're looking for. Jumping on, just talking about time frame with regard to this is away from PFAS, talking about time frame that can dictate if you're looking for a closure of a site quickly, you're looking at weeks to months, you're, yeah, it restricts the technology you can talk to into the like of ISCO, mixing to, to create that uh, contact, activation thermal. As you extend the time frame that you have available to, you can get into biological processes and uh, sort of m and type processes. Um, I want to jump into the last section. I have about five, ten minutes, I think. Okay, so five minutes. The, the, I mentioned it at the very start. I think one of, the, one of the important things to realize is that there's a lot of technologies out there, but the state of the practice in these technologies is a lot of different from the state of the art. And that's just the industry's driven that. The industry's driven that because you're out there, you're doing this work, the clients want things done cheaper, you don't want to say that you don't understand the technology or you can't do this technology for them. So what's, what's led to is these rule of thumb type approaches or state of the practice that are, aren't necessarily using this science and where I sit, in, in the biggest issue is in remedial design, shortcuts in remedial design that end up with uncertainties that result in uncertainties in your outcome. So I'm going to show you a couple of examples of that quickly, and we'll be done. All right, you need this. You have that one's good. I got to be known that. But you know, you need, this is very typical. You need this to accomplish your certainty, and basically, you have people out there that are basically providing you, um, you know, lesser than that. And that's a very common problem. Um, I'm going to give you a couple of examples. Um, so I'm sure a lot of you have dealt with solid vapor extraction, very simple technology. Matter of fact, I've done my master's in doctorate work in air based technologies back in the very early 80s, um, basically. And 
I would say 90 plus percent of solid vapor extraction systems are inefficiently designed. You don't see a failure with solid vapor extraction as much as it takes a long time to work. And the reason being is that most solid vapor extraction systems are based, the design is based on the state of the practice. The state of the practice is you go out to a site, you install a well, you have, have, have express a stress on that well by a flow and a vacuum, and you measure the vacuum propagation away from that well, and they use that vacuum propagation to say, okay, if I've got vacuum out at 50 feet, I feel comfortable that I'm drawing air in, and they're basically, that's my radius of influence, that's how I'm going to design the system. The reality is that that's really not a lot to do with the effectiveness or efficiency of the solid vapor extraction system. If you consider the science of that, when you have a contaminant with this glass of water, overline that contaminant, the air becomes saturated with the contaminant. There's no more contaminant going to go into that air than the maximum saturation value. Whatever comes out of the water goes back in at the same rate. So I need to exchange that air with saturated with contamination with clean air to basically have an efficient solid vapor extraction system. So poor volume exchanges with clean air is really the state of the art of design of solid vapor extraction systems, which ex very, very few people look at. And that's an example of a site in California that's been operating uh, basically 15 years. Most of the mass is still there. They've got vacuum all over the place. The problem is they designed it and it's according to the state of practice and it's very common. The state of the art basically using those poor volume exchanges. We have a site in the Midwest 18 months, half a million pounds removed, closed. Again, state of the practice, we're still up. That's one example. Here's another a quick example. Um, and then we'll be close to done. A very common st a state of the practice uh, design process today is you're being under pressure to do cheaper. You go to a product vendor to provide uh, how much of your product do I need, whether it's a biological process, a chemical process, and you, you, you go that direction. And basically, and because it's cheap, because they'll do it for you for free. The issue is, it's not the, the product vendor. The product's fine. The product is what its product's supposed to do. The remedial design is the issue. Because when you do a site characterization, um, typically, historically, they're done compartmentalized. You know, you do your, your, your uh, remedial investigation, you do your feasibility study. A lot of this is going to be talked in detail this afternoon. But basically, there's so a lot of times there's information that I need or you need as a remedial design engineer that basically isn't part of a characterization study. And that's what happens in here. So this is a typical example. I'm going to show you a quick example. And then Jennifer is going to yank me off the table because even although I remove slides, I'm still going over. Um, so this is one of this is super fun site in South Carolina where we get a, a treatability study uh, contract to look at which of the oxygen releasing compounds out there basically was going to be the most appropriate for this petroleum contamination at this site. The EPA wanted to know which, which one they should be using. So we took the site-specific information that you would characterize, characterization data you typically get, and we give it to each of three vendors of oxygen releasing compounds. Now, these oxygen releasing compounds are pretty similar. They're all within a couple of percent of each other with oxygen. Typically, a, a pound of petroleum requires about three pounds of oxygen to destroy it, which requires about 15 pounds of these uh, materials, because they're all about 15 to 20 percent oxygen. The rest is in our materials. So, but the characterization data basically is, oh, the contaminant in the soil, contaminant in the groundwater. But with petroleum, sometimes it's the PAHs or the BTECs, the ones that are regulated concern. But from an oxygen need perspective, TPH that may be there is also got a need. Reduced compounds in the subsurface have a need for oxygen. Organic matter has a need for oxygen. These are typically not measured in your characterization study. So what happens to the vendors when you send them that information, they basically look at that information, they do the stoichiometry, which I've just done for you, one pound to 15 pounds of product. And they basically said, okay, I need this amount of my material to get a 90%, that was our target 90% reduction. This is how much of my material I need. But I know there's additional needs beyond the target contaminant for the target. But what is that? The answer is they don't have an answer. Therefore, they have to put a factor of safety in. And that factor of safety introduces uncertainty into your result. And that factor of safety could be more than you need, it could be less than you need. In this particular case, it was a lot less. So one dose of these materials, and we chose the maximum dose that anyone said, one dose was supposed to get a 90% reduction in the contaminant mass in the treatability study. And the, the maximum was about 18%. So in this particular case, even after we had enough money in the budget to do three doses, so even after three doses, we we're only at about 50% with a 90% target for one dose. So basically, again, it shows you, I'm not pointing out again, it's, it's not the product. The product releases oxygen. 
um, it's the remedial design. If you really want to have a certainty, you have to understand what is that non-target demand that is missing from your characterization study. You can do that by measuring other parameters in the characterization phase, or you can measure that by doing a treatability study for a site-specific condition and find out what it is. And this is what this treatability study was showing. One last example uh, is basically, and this is very common. I, I, I reviewed several of these case studies last year that are all identical. And this was a failure of ISCO uh, using peroxide. And they went to the site, they injected, basically didn't work. Then they came and I said, hey, um, why did this not work? Can you do a peer review and tell us why did this not work? Well, the state of the practice in uh, some of the treatability studies that are being done out there, especially with peroxide, are flawed. And basically, this one was flawed because it, it was considered a success because when they done a treatability study, they basically used peroxide, it was chlorinated solvents, and at the end of the study, they showed non-detect in the reactor. But what with peroxide in particular, the issue is peroxide will dissociate to a gas, oxygen. And oxygen and gas, you can't keep in the reactor, or the reactor will explode, and therefore you have to release it. Um, if you don't measure the amount of gas that forms, which you can also theoretically calculate from the amount of peroxide you put into the reactor, and you don't measure the concentration in the, the off gas from that oxygen of the contaminant of concern, you're, you're not getting a proper answer. And in this particular case, the amount that was in the gas did one sample of the gas phase concentration, and I could calculate the amount of gas that was being produced from that amount of peroxide. It was equated to the amount of glass that was in there to begin with. So essentially, they got a positive result from the treatability study, but it was because they stripped the TC out of the reactor as a result of the gas formation and the peroxide. That was a red flag that was not identified that basically would have told them this could fail in the field. The other thing that the other two things were the half-life, when you're introducing peroxide into the environment, you need a half-life of about 15 hours minimum to distribute it from your injection wells to where you want it to go before it produces the oxygen gas and the radical species that you want to do the oxidation process. What wasn't determined from this lab was that the half-life was less than four hours. So that, that peroxide was going to dissociate very rapidly in the vicinity of the injection point and was not going to move as a oxidant into the formation. That's again what happened. And the third thing that basically, or the other thing that happened to this you have to be able to transfer these to the field and basically in the reactor, 21 pore volumes of solution was added to the American soil. That's the equivalent of doing 21 applications in the field, maybe more than 21 applications. So even if it worked, you wouldn't have known really what it took. Without, so you need to do these tests scalable up to the uh, full scale application field. Paul, again, we'll talk about that a little, little more. And I think I'm done. And there's uh, some of those sorts of information that if you want to read about any of the general technologies, again, you can read those. Clue in is the EPA one. Basically, the Navy have a good one, the ITRC, the uh, Federal Roundtable, basically. And if you want to look at contaminants in specific, EPA is a good one for contaminant focus, you know, what technologies are applicable. So there's a lot of information out there, but uh, be careful about state of the art versus state of the practice. Thank you. Thank you, Mike.